Let's go before the Lord and pray as we jump into the word. So Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you, Lord, that your truth, that your reality, God, that your point of view on the way things ought to be is found in this book. Thank you, Lord, for protecting it, for leading us to it, and for opening it up to us today. So God, as we open up the Bible, I pray that it'd be plain to us, that our ears would hear your voice, that our eyes would see your ways, and God, that our hearts would be soft, to be shaped and molded by you. So today, God, we give you this place. We give you this time as we jump into the word. We honor you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you're on the chat, you can say amen. Give some praise hands. Do what you got to do. Because today, I'd love to see you participate and share your thoughts as we're going ahead and going through the word today. So let's get into this. Because the truth of the matter is, look, on a regular day, life is crazy. Life is chaotic and things are weird, right? And that's a regular day. And I'm not really too sure, you know, when you're listening to this, but if you're listening to this right now in, uh, you know, 2020, things are kind of crazy. And the bottom line is this, is that when things get crazy, a lot of times we can feel pressured to begin to look on the bleaker things in life. Or we can make strange and weird and off the wall decisions like tackling people for toilet paper. Look, it just gets a little weird. Okay, so I don't know what your life situation is right now. I don't know who's sitting next to you. I don't know who's looking at you from the other side of the freeway. I, I don't know if your neighbor's looking at you through quarantine on the other side of the neighborhood. But here's what I've got to tell you is it's time to plant a garden. Now, I don't know if that makes sense. Maybe that's kind of strange to you. Um, but I think what God wants you to know today is it's time to plant a garden. Look, what that means is it's time for you to learn how to thrive in a chaotic world. Because even on our best of days, things get chaotic. Things get kind of crazy, things get kind of wild, and, and, and we have a hard time gathering our thoughts, thinking ahead, and figuring out what it is that God wants to do. I mean, sometimes it can just sound like somebody's turned on Metallica in the back of your head and you can't hear any darn thoughts you're trying to think. And you can just feel inundated, underwater with these things. So let's talk. This is the crazy thing about this idea of planting a garden. You know, and it's okay if you don't have a, green, you have a green thumb or you can look and see your garden right now and all the dead tomato plants that you killed last week. Uh, it's okay because what God's trying to tell you seems a little strange in the middle of a chaotic mess. You know, when, you, when we think of gardens and parks and things like that, they're usually pretty peaceful and serene. So it doesn't really fit. It's kind of like, it's kind of like that one family member you have. It's like that one friend you have that always finds the perfect time to tell the worst joke. Or maybe it's, it's a really serious time, really somber, and they're trying to liven it up with some jokes or some, some off the wall comment and it just doesn't hit well. It puts a wet blanket on the entire conversation and you begin to think, who invited him here? Why do we keep this guy around? And, and you begin to wonder like, who, where do you get off thinking these kind of things? It's just the wrong time, the wrong place, the wrong joke. And it's like the person's tone deaf. You see, there's this moment in history where there was a bunch of people going through a major crisis and God decides to speak to them. And he kind of drops one of these really off the wall comments. And he begins to say something to them that doesn't fit. It doesn't make any sense. It's kind of like that friend that walks up into that moment and drops the wrong joke at the wrong time. But when it comes to, when it comes to God telling us things that don't make sense, if you pause, take a minute, and you begin to think, what's he trying to say? You can begin to find this amazing truth that pulls things together in a new way. And that whole bit of chaos that we've been struggling in, that noise in the back of your head that wants to drown out the voice of reason, when you listen to God's strange comments in the word, in your prayer time, in those moments you have with him, then you can begin to find your way out of that chaos and into a place where you can learn how to thrive in a strange situation that you have no idea on your own how to get out of. Hey, let's talk about some good news here. You see, in Jeremiah 29, you can find this comment where God's asking you to build a garden right here, right now. 
And I'm not just talking like a thyme garden, an herb garden, you know, I don't know, whatever your favorite things are, you know, a little cilantro. Uh, but, but he wants to find a way to make peace in the middle of your chaos. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29 is great. Matter of fact, chances are that three-fourths of you out there probably have Jeremiah 29 tattooed somewhere on your body. You know, you're just waiting for the beaches to be open so you can show it off, right? Jeremiah 29, 11, that's, that, 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 that's the famous verse that we all come to love. And it's great and it's true. But the problem is, is Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has a plan and a purpose for your future is smack dab in the middle of a big story. And if you only look at Jeremiah 29, 11, you miss the best part. This really strange conversation God has with people that just don't know how to hear it. Let's go ahead and read this out. Let's read this out. Jeremiah 29, 11, or excuse me, Jeremiah 29, 1 says this. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It was after King Jeconah and his queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials, Judah, Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the metal, work metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. It sets the stage, Jeremiah 29. This is a story of exile. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you, but let me break this story down. You see, exile has got to have been one of the greatest, worst crises of the entire history of God's people. They were living life, they had their country, and God's people were living in the country of Israel, the southern part, Judah. And out of nowhere, the greatest military in the entire known world rolls in. Babylon comes through. And systematically, they begin to destroy and deport and bring utter chaos into that country. They burned the city, they burned the walls, the temple, Solomon's temple, they destroyed it. And they began to systematically take the best and the brightest in the country, put them in chains and ship them off to another nation, a place they'd never been to, with a language they didn't speak, a culture they had no concept about, and it was completely foreign. Their entire world shifted upside down in the matter of days. I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, but everything they had known, the entire world they'd grown up in, the world their grandparents and great-grandparents had grown up in, was gone, eradicated, and in a blink of an eye, nothing was the same again. Now, this happened because Judah, well, they decided to turn their back on God. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. Things got a little rough. Things got a little crazy. Next thing you know, the army's rolling in. But inside of that was a minority. There was a minor minority group of people, what the Bible calls a remnant. And a remnant, this little group of people, well, they were loving God. They were going to temple. They were obeying the law. They were loving their neighbor. They were worshiping like they were supposed to. And the challenge is this, is you have this little group of people that didn't deserve anything wrong and they get caught up in this whirlwind of destruction, carted off. Uh, maybe you remember, right, we just read, we were talking about Nebuchadnezzar, right? I mean, I don't know if any, any, any Sunday school kids out there, the Nebuchadnezzar songs, Salty, you know, uh, a super book. I mean, you know, just, just, just type out in the chat your favorite kids song, you know, Father Abraham, all that kind of stuff. It begins to come together because in Nebuchadnezzar's world, we remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These, these young men who loved God with all their heart, and there they are in the middle of this destruction. And there in Babylon, in their changes, they begin to think and ask this question. They begin to say, God, what did we do to deserve this? God, where, where are you? God, where did you go? What did I do wrong? They begin to say, God, I, I, I thought this wasn't supposed to happen this way. And they're caught up with all these questions. Now, I don't know about you, there's moments where I feel exactly like this, especially in the situation that I find myself in, just like you. Now here's the challenge we have, because if God's asking us to build a garden, this really weird request in this really weird time, you've got to wonder, well, wait a minute. 
What about my prayers? What, what about the things I've read in the Bible? And the challenge is a lot of times when we see faith or we see our trust in God, our expectation is, okay, so if I pray something and I believe something, then, you know, God will answer it because, because he, it's, it's like a genie or a butler. And, and God's job is to make me feel good and comfortable and warm and safe at times. And the problem is this, is that faith, real faith is filled with risk. It's filled with challenge. It's filled with this with this ability that we have to go into the unknown, into the unstable at times and still find peace. That's what peace is. Matter of fact, I'm reminded of what Jesus said. Jesus said, he said, all these things I've been telling you is for this, that you would have peace. And then he turns around and says, now in the world, you'll have tribulation. I don't know. I don't gotta tell you about your problems. You already know enough, right? You already, have, you already have a list of them and most of them you've been trying to ignore if you're anything like me. But the, Jesus is keeping things real when he says, in this world, you'll have trouble. But don't worry, because I've overcome the world. Jesus says, the chaos is always going to be there. Sometimes a lot, sometimes a little, but the chaos is always there. If you've got kids, if, and if you're sitting with your kids, you can close your ears, they're crazy, they're nuts. And they're the ones that cause a lot of it. <laughs> but once we begin to accept that, that the world's just gonna be crazy and I don't gotta get caught up in it because he's overcome the world. See, this is a story of the exile. This is your story, it's my story. You see, Jesus says you don't have to be a part of the chaos because I, he, Jesus has overcome the world and we get to be a part of the plan that he has. You see, through Jeremiah's words, he begins to break down this message of what he's trying to tell these people that are in the wrong place for somebody else's mistake. You know, they don't deserve it. And they're wondering, God, what the heck is going on? He begins to insert these really strange words in Jeremiah 29. He says in Jeremiah 29, verse four, he says, this is what the Lord of hosts says. I'm the God of Israel. And this is to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile, into Jerusalem and Babylon, from Jerusalem to Babylon. He says this strange thing. Now, build houses, live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. He says, take wives, have sons, have daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage so that they can bear sons and daughters. They can multiply there and they won't decrease. And see, this is bizarre because you think, okay, God's speaking and I got it because God's going to give me the way out, the magic exit door. He's going to do the ninja move where he throws a poof thing on the ground and in the smoke and then you're gone. You're back home. He said, you know, we're thinking God's speaking. He's going to rain down fire on these people like he's done before. And instead, God says the most inappropriate thing in the world. You're in another country you don't belong in, so build some houses, plant some gardens, make families and grow families. He says here, in this chaos, you can increase, not decrease. And that's weird, that's strange. But there's a beauty in it because when you see what God's saying is that I don't need a good situation to still be in control. He's telling us this, that even in the worst of plans and ideas, I can still show you how good I'm, I am. That's the story of exile. That's the story of all the people, the remnant, the ones who stuck with it. That's how they got through it. You see, what God was saying is that you can prosper in your place right here, right now. You don't need the problem to go away because God's bigger than the problem. You don't, you, 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 know, you don't need a smooth, easy sailing you know, retirement life. He says, right now through the bumps and the bruises, I can be there with you. I'll take you by the hand. I'll walk you through the valley of the shadow of death and I'll, be, I'll meet you on the other side. You see, God says you can prosper in your 
place, right there, wherever you are. If you're stuck in the home alone, if you're, if, if you're single and you've been single for too long, if you're having challenges in your marriage, look, if you don't know how, how, what college is going to look like next year, if you're in a spot where everything you would bet on is now swirling down the drain, the good news is this, is that's chaos and God's still God in the middle of the chaos. And it's time to settle into his peace and plant a garden. You can prosper right now in your place. He said, increase, don't decrease. You see, you, you gotta recognize that the hardship that you may feel, the pressure you may feel right now, well, that's the very thing God's gonna use to elevate you to the place he wants you. It's only through hardship that a person can grow. That's the only way muscles are grown. Right? That's the only way diamonds are made. That's the only way that pearls are developed is through frustration and anguish and pressure and hardship and irritation. It sounds like a relationship almost, right? That's where you're at right now. Chances are, I know that's where I'm at. God's making something out of this mess that we're in. And he says, it's not a hindrance. It's an opportunity. That's where the prospering comes in. When I say the word prosper, I mean, you have the ability right now to make the most of the situation you're in. You see, something's an inconvenience only as much as you allow it to be. It's a perspective. See, really an inconvenience, it's, a, it's an opportunity in disguise. You can win because God's on your side and God never loses. So that means no matter what situation you find yourself in, you've got to find that moment where God is putting his hand in that place. You can prosper in your place, wherever you are. It's just a matter of us being able to listen in the middle of our exile, in the middle of our hardship, where he's at. He continues in Jeremiah 29, 10 and 11. This is the verse you've been waiting for. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed in Babylon, I'll visit you. I'll fulfill you in my promise and I will bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans of welfare, of goodness, of not of evil, not of harm. I have plans for a future and a hope. Oh, come on, somebody. I don't know if you've ever had a dream, but right here, I'm going to tell you this, that God is here keeping it alive and well, waiting for you to take advantage of it. I told you, it's a bizarre thing to hear in the middle of the biggest problem of your life. It's a bizarre thing to hear when all you can see is dark clouds. But that's where our faith comes in and you can begin to take advantage of it because God's there with you. You see, what's ahead of you is better. What's ahead of you right now is better and that's called hope. That's called hope. And that's what God's telling his people right now. He says, guys, look, Things are rough right now, and it might be rough for a little bit. But he says, I'm going to tell you this, that all the time you spend in this challenge, in this chaos, is going to get you ready for the blessing I have on the other side of it. But think about it. Right now, if you're stuck at home with your family, with your friends, if you're stuck at home, maybe with people that you thought you liked but you don't really like, this is your opportunity to say, I'm going to work at things out with them. I'm going to spend time with them. I'm going to take this free time that I have right now. And instead of thinking of all the things that are going wrong or all the frustrations, I'm going to work on things now because when, when the clouds part, when things go better, when everything begins to find its new normal, all of a sudden what's going to happen is you're not going to have that same time. You have an opportunity right now to make the most of it because what's ahead is better. Um, I remember Pastor Paul, our LaRocca pastor here, was sharing a story with us. And he grew up in the Dominican Republic. He was telling a story of when he was a small child. And um, in the DR, he was, uh, he was on the island in his house when one, a hurricane came through. And he said as a child, he vividly remembers this hurricane blowing through, his house shaking. And he said he remembers as a child being frightened, putting both hands on the window, trying to hold the window in place as the winds and the rain and the sleet beat down on it. The hurricane tried as hard as it could to push through that window and his little boy arms are there 
holding it in place. You see, you see, it's that moment of hardship where he's clinging on for his life with every ounce of strength that he had. And as that hurricane blew through, he woke up the next morning. And another morning came and another morning came. You know, we were talking just the other day about this situation. I remember him telling us, he said, you know, I've been through a hurricane. I've held the window back. I've been through that hardship. So I know we'll get through this one. It's amazing when you begin to remember all the good things God's done for you and all the good things he's going to do for you. You see, what's ahead is better if you'll just hold on. I love how Galatians tells us, don't grow weary in doing good. Because if you refuse to quit, the one rule of faith is you don't quit. Then if you refuse to quit, you'll get the reward at the end. You see, when it comes to exile, when it comes to this chaos, when it comes to planting a garden, you've got to remember that God is alive and present. See, when you begin to remember this, then it makes it bearable. So God tells them to build houses in a garden. Now, this isn't just an herb garden. Back in the day, gardens were a sign of, of wealth. It was a sign of royalty. It was a sign of this person really has it together. A garden was something that you would plant um, if you expected God to be close to you. Something that was attached to kind of like temples and stuff. Yeah, you know, they would do that because they knew that it was a symbol of the presence of God. I mean, heck, in Genesis, God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. God wasn't just saying, hey, it's a good time to, to grow some carrots. He said, make a space because you're so prosperous in the middle of this exile where we can walk together. See, the problem was this, is back in their homeland, you know, all the people of Israel living in Judah, their temple had been burned and that's where God lived. God was the God of Israel and they weren't in Israel anymore. So they asked ourselves, wait a minute, the way we used to worship is gone. Does that mean that God's left us too? And we can say, well, worship has changed for me. Church has changed for me. The way I used to worship God is not the same. But God comes and says in Jeremiah 29, 12, he says, then, then you'll call upon my name and you'll come and pray to me and I will hear you. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and I'll restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places that you've been driven, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. You see, God said, I can still hear you. He said, I'm not gone. I know you're in a weird, strange place, but I'm still listening. I don't need a temple to live. I don't need a country, a border to get stuck behind. God's saying, wherever you go, there I'll be. God's saying, where you are, I am. The New Testament says something real similar. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, it's written for we, me, and you are the temple of the living God. God said years ago, God said, I will live in them and I will walk. That sounds like the garden. I will walk among them. I'll be their God and they will be my people. God said, you still have a family. You see, your chaos is something you can thrive in if you take the mentality of an exile. I don't belong here, but I'm not staying here. And just because I am here, doesn't mean God's gone. Doesn't mean I can't increase and not decrease. These people lost their businesses, their farms. They lost their families. I'm sure somebody was thinking, they destroyed the well I met my wife at. And then Babylon carried them away. But God said their best days are ahead of them if you'll only follow and believe. I think about a situation like this one. You know, it's kind of hard to meet in church. But I think about it is when the day comes, when the day comes that we all get to get back together, it's like a family reunion. I haven't seen you in forever. Hugs, kisses, celebration. I, you know, you've heard it. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. So today, recognize I'm in exile. I don't belong here, 
I don't belong in this chaos, but it won't last forever. And wherever I go, I take peace with me. Hey, today, I want to encourage you. Be a part of that family reunion. So the question then, I guess, is what family do you belong in?